Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Today we are going to take a look at the deeper meaning of Mars in the sign of Pisces. Um, this is going to be a rewind episode in which we look back at one of the planets in profile episodes that I did um, some years ago on Mars's meaning when in the sign of Pisces. So I hope you will enjoy this and that it will also turn you on to those planets in profile episodes, which I've done in the past. Uh, we've taken Mercury, Mars, and Venus through all 12 signs. You can find those in the archives of my playlists on my channel. Um, we are going to be doing the moon. We are currently doing the moon through the signs and we'll be doing the next in that series next week on the moon in cancer. So uh, that's coming up shortly. And I know you guys will enjoy that with Kaylee coming back with moon poetry on cancer. That ought to be great. Anyway, um, before we get into it, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe, share your comments and reflections. Tell us a story. If you have Mars and Pisces or you have something unique to add to the conversation about Mars and Pisces, it would be cool to hear from you. You can find a transcript of any of my daily talks on the website, nightlightastrology.com. And right now, two things that we are promoting. Uh, the one is our speaker series talks, which are coming up this weekend. And I'm trying to make people aware of them in case you aren't. A lot of people are new to the channel and may not be aware of the fact that we have a quarterly speaker series that is totally free and open to the public thanks to the success of our annual Kickstarter campaign. So when you scroll down in March, under the March speaker series there, you'll see this weekend, Dan Waits is giving a talk on Pluto and Aquarius. Next weekend, Jolly Knot is giving a talk on the Lot of Fortune. You can check those talks out, register, and attend for free. On the events page, click on Live Talks. You'll see on April 18th, my next webinar on uh, the outer planets in love, sex, and relationships is happening. Uranus in love, right before Jupiter and Uranus can join. We're going to take a look at Uranus's meaning in love and relationships and how to work with that planet and understand it better. Also, on the courses page, first year course starts again in June. I'm going to be going into promo mood mode for that soon. And if you scroll down, you'll see it starts June 16th, the very bottom enrollments open. So need-based tuition assistance, payment plan, early bird payment, all available now if you want to start checking out that course. The other course that I'm promoting is Ashley's Herbal Apprenticeship Program. You can learn more about her work on her YouTube channel, Skyhouse Herbs, where she publishes weekly on plant spirit medicine, or follow her on Instagram at Skyhouse Herbs. When you're on the website, uh, you can look at the courses page to see the Herbal Foundation's apprenticeship. It starts on April 24th. And at the end of today's video, if you stick around afterward, you'll hear me uh, interview Ashley about the program. So on that note, I hope that you guys have had a nice week, that you'll have a great weekend, and that you will enjoy this deeper exploration of the meaning of Mars in Pisces. Bye, everyone. Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. It is uh, November 16th, 2018, and I'm sitting down right now to do another episode of Planets in Profile. Today's episode, we're going to take a look at Mars in the sign of uh, Pisces. Uh, Mars has just recently ingressed into the sign of Pisces. And so as Mars and Venus this year and into 2019 are moving through the signs, I'm going to be continually doing episodes on uh, the um, uh, different planets in the different signs. We'll start with Mars and Venus, and then gradually I'll uh, move on maybe a little bit later uh, next year to starting to cover other planets like uh, Mercury and the moon and things like that, but sort of starting with Mars and Venus. So this episode, we're looking at uh, Mars in the sign of Pisces. Let's go ahead and switch over so we can see this cool view. All right, so our uh, our recent entry of Mars into the sign of Pisces, I get a lot of um, emails from readers and viewers always asking, so can you talk about what it means if I have this planet in my birth chart, or can you tell me what this planet's characteristics are like when it's in this new sign? So that's really, again, the intention of this um, series. So uh, in looking at Mars in the sign of Pisces, there are a few guidelines that if you understand and you can kind of integrate into your understanding and of the language of astrology, you will um, be able to have uh, a pretty wide uh, range of descriptives or adjectives to describe Mars and Pisces with. Your understanding will be more intuitive and more flexible. So uh, Mars in Pisces is the double-bodied feminine water sign, which is the sign of the fishes, and it is the domicile or feminine home of Jupiter. Mars has no essential dignity in uh, Pisces, which means basically that uh, this is not a place that Mars is either greatly harmed or greatly helped. This is not a place where Mars has some kind of amazing 
strength or great affinity with the planetary host, and nor is it one where he has any kind of affliction or hard time with the planetary host. So it's a pretty neutral space for Mars. It can go in either uh, direction, depending, always depending on where the host is at. So this is a, an important kind of teaching for really understanding planets. Um, a planet is never to be interpreted in a vacuum. You can't just interpret Mars and Pisces. In any chart, Mars and Pisces will always depend, never on its own, always will depend on where Jupiter is located, what Jupiter is doing. Just like in the same way, if you can understand this analogy, if I come to your house as a guest, I don't, in a, in a, in a strict sense of etiquette, uh, that was special that was followed in the ancient world with people coming into your home and being guests in your home and not just your home, but your family or your tribe or your nation or your land or something like that. Um, the rules about how you would treat a stranger or a visitor were very specific and uh, much more formal in some regards uh, than they are today in our sort of modern world. Things are a little bit more casual. But if you have a more traditional family, for example, you know that when guests come in, there's very specific protocol. And uh, whether that's taking their coats, uh, making sure you offer them something to eat and drink, giving them some place to sit that's comfortable, you try to meet their needs. So similarly, the whole concept of rulership uh, is actually in some ways very misguided because there's not really, um, in the ancient Greek tradition, the word oikodespotes or oikodespotes, I've heard it pronounced in different ways. Um, uh, it was more like the steward or the host of a house. And a house was not just, you know, your house, but a house of, you know, like I've said this before, Game of Thrones reference, a house that belonged to um, a lot of people, a, a, a whole um, family, the extended family. So um, the, when a planet is in, a, in any sign, it is in the home or the house of another planet. And whatever, whenever it's in that sign, it will want whatever it wants by nature of what it is as a planet. So Mars, for example, wants action wants violence, wants war and blood and cutting, all heavy Mars, the god of war kinds of stuff. Mars wants severing and division. Mars wants to penetrate and to divide. Mars wants to cut and conquer. Mars wants uh, confrontation, competition, hostility, and um, muscle. Mars likes strength. But um, Mars is also courage and valor and bravery, guardianship, advocacy, the warrior, sort of noble Chival, you know, sort of chivalrous Mars qualities. Um, and so those are the things that Mars is always in need of because that's who Mars is. And uh, we always treat someone when they're in our home. Uh, we give them what they need based upon who they are and what their unique needs are. So those are the things that Mars needs. Generally speaking, Mars wants or desires to express those qualities. So when it's in a sign that is not its own sign, it relies on the generosity of the host. And if it's in a debilitated place or a more powerful place, it will rely on the host to provide for it uh, either, and, and that host will provide for it either more or less uh, easily or in a more or less friendly manner or with more or less difficulty or just with more or less resonance. So for example, if I'm in your house and um, you know, your family is very, very strict or stern or, uh, you know, all the ducks in a row. And I'm kind of like, I'm much more laid back, put the feet up, relax, laugh, take it easy, don't follow the rules so much, make them up as you go. If that's my attitude, how easy will it be for me to feel as though I'm getting what I need when I'm in that person's home, right? You get, it, you get what I'm saying? Or vice versa. Um, so you have to always take that into consideration. So Mars in Pisces is in Jupiter's home. Jupiter is its host. Jupiter is going to provide for it. And what it means when we say that it has no essential dignity in Pisces is that there's no real conflict and there's no real great uh, immediate resonance with this particular home. 
So it's pretty neutral. It's like, you know, could, it could kind of go either way, but it's better than being afflicted for sure, right? So it's not like there's some kind of real beef with the host. That's what you're trying to key in on when you understand a planet and a sign. So uh, what we need to understand then is what kinds of things does Jupiter give to Mars based on the kinds of things that Mars desires? So Mars, you could say, also is going to, ex a simpler way of thinking about it is Mars is going to express himself through the lens of Jupiter. You're kind of learning to blend the two significations together a little bit. But I find this analogy about what does Jupiter provide for a guest in Pisces as a really easy way to organize and, and your thoughts and create a meaningful interpretation. So what are those gifts or qualities that Jupiter gives to Mars when Mars is in Jupiter's home being like, hey, I'm hungry. Okay, so we already said Mars wants violence, cutting, aggression, hostility, courage. Um, it wants uh, guardianship, advocacy, protection, uh, war, battle. Okay, so all of these light and dark sides of Mars. Well, what does Jupiter have to give? Jupiter has uh, benefits, just generally speaking, as a planet that gives benefits, good fortune, good luck. It gives uh, grace. It gives that sort of disproportionate sense of having gained something uh, that's bigger maybe necessarily than what one feels one deserves. And that can go in either negative or positive directions. It makes things bigger. Jupiter is a planet of faith and wisdom and hope. Uh, Jupiter is a planet that is very, it usually is associated with fertility and the, the growth or proliferation of things. So what does that mean? Well, and then you have to qualify this by saying, well, what kind of, you know, what kind of Jupiter uh, do we have when we're in the feminine home of Jupiter? It's, it's a more um, emotional, it's more feminine, it's more relational. Um, you could say it's a bit more changeable. Um, so Mars in this sign receives um, emotional courage, right? So you get that kind of thing. Uh, emotional courage and grandeur, it gets uh, qualities of emotional bigness and courage, uh, so you, your Jupiter is granting Mars what it wants, but adding, you know, sort of, it's like, well, if you want like a uh, courage and a fight, well, I'll give you faith and hope and bigness. And that's where you get almost this. That's why I have St. Michael pictured here. You get this feeling of like the holy war or the holy battle or the, the uh, going to, um, to battle over beliefs, uh, the, emotional feeling of needing to defend or protect or guard against something. Um, the sense of there being a, an, an emotional sense of vigor and competition that is uh, also connected with a, a wise or sagely quality. So that's how they, they end up blending like that because Jupiter is providing for Mars. So again, Mars says, I'd like, um, you know, I would like to uh, I'd like to fight someone. And Jupiter says, uh, how about I give you some optimism and emotional enthusiasm and uh, grandiosity? Okay, so if you have a good noble fight, that could be a really great thing. Boy, you have some, you know, you've got some real charisma, kind of the wind is at your back and there's a sense of uh, faith in what you're doing. And that that's a good thing to bring into a fight. You know what I mean? If you've got a fight for something, uh, having a sense of being confirmed in your vision, being supported in your beliefs that in that fueling the, the fight or the competition, you know, to believe in something matters. So that might be a really beneficial thing. If you have any kind of action in the world to take, Mars generally is associated with action. Any kind of action can be fueled by optimism, hope, faith, emotional excitement. However, on the flip side, you can also go into territory that's sort of, you know, emotionally uh, grandiose and um, maybe overly dramatic. Sometimes people get a little bit of a martyr or a savior complex with Mars and Pisces. It kind of blows things out of proportion. It makes them too big. You know, uh, I'm on a crusade and you're like, really, you're just, you're, all you're trying to do is get your breakfast. You know what I mean? And someone's on this emotionally impassioned, you know, tirade about, you know, how, how beautiful their morning muffin is going to be or something. It can be like, it can be like that where it's, it's just something that's so 
seemingly trivial that someone is, it's just has a lot of bravado about. So you do want to be careful of em, sort of emo, emotional machismo and bravado it can be very Shakespearean and changeable with the, the double bodied uh, or mutable quality of Pisces. Um, but generally speaking, it's also like that feeling of like riding high. There's a card in the tarot, I believe it's a six of wands, and it shows a man sort of riding on top of a horse in the rider weight anyway. And he's got like a staff and there's people in the background like, oh, he's coming victorious or he's going off to war. Or he's coming, I think he has a wreath around his staff. So I think he's probably coming back from something victorious. That is very like Jupiter, um, Mars in Pisces. Okay, so uh, this gives you some ideas of the kinds of qualities that uh, can come through this. For example, sometimes there's also, Mars is related to science and even to mathematics um, because it's about division and it's about cutting into things and uh, dividing and analyzing things requires kind of a surgical uh, dissection. So Mars related to surgery, also related to dissection. Sometimes you'll have an auspicious moment for a surgery if Mars has to cut something out, remove something and make something whole again. Sometimes that's kind of a good sign for trying to restore health, but through some kind of more invasive procedure, Mars being a little bit more invasive. It doesn't have to be intensely invasive. It could just be like minorly invasive, but still a good outcome. Um, you can also think about any kind of analysis that you have to do leading to greater comprehension of a problem or leading to greater comprehension, wisdom, or knowledge. So analysis and greater encompassing wisdom. It's a great time to have a deeper comprehension of something that's more scientific. Um, whereas sometimes it may just feel like, you know how science is, sometimes you're breaking things up, you're breaking things up, and that analytical mind, it, 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 sometimes it doesn't know when to stop. And Jupiter, on the other hand, is a planet that wants to build greater holes. It wants greater unity. And so when it comes together with Mars, sometimes through Mars wants analysis and cutting, and Jupiter's like, well, I've got unity for you. You know, will that work? And, and it, actually something really nice can come out of that. On the other hand, again, uh, sometimes when you put those kind of that cutting and dividing and analyzing quality with the greater um, uh, sort of bigness of Jupiter, you can also have people getting really puffed up about their ideologies, their faith, their beliefs, people that get, um, that believe that they're getting inspired by something that's coming from on high, and they don't realize in some ways that they're just being co-opted by the grandiosity of Jupiter and Mars, which are really like, uh, in some ways, like, you know, demigods that can sort of possess and pull us around like on puppet strings. So um, the on the other hand, sometimes big initiatives, big ideas um, that are a little risky or that, you know, kind of sound the trumpet or whatever. Um, so, you know, sometimes they're, they're needed and they, they get things done. So you have to think about the combination and remember the analogy. Um, Mars is a house guest in Jupiter's realm. How does Jupiter get host and meet the needs or desires of Mars? You know, think like that. It really, really helps to um, create interpretations. So if you have this in your birth chart, hopefully this has also given you some sense. Right now in the sky in 2018, Mars is going right into a square with its host Jupiter, which I've already written about. You can go check that out on my website at nightlightastrology.com. If you like this kind of stuff, by the way, I teach a class called Ancient Astrology for Modern Times. Uh, we are starting a new one-year program. It's 30 courses plus 12 guest lectures, so 42 classes on the year. Only 30 of them are the ones that I teach and are sort of required. But um, it's a brilliant, awesome, uh, friendly, warm group class that I teach online through Zoom meetings, just like the one I'm recording on right now. And we start from the ground up and try to reteach people basic astrological concepts from the ancient uh, perspective, which really allows people to become much more organized and concise in the way that they delineate charts or in people who are starting from scratch, it's really good. People who have studied a lot but don't necessarily know the ancient roots, also very helpful. So that class starts on Saturdays, December 1st. This is in 2018. I'm sure this will be on my page for a while. So if you're listening to it, I probably will still be teaching this course for a while. So check my website and see what other courses I'm up to if you're watching this somewhere out in the future. 
All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody so much. And I hope that you're having a, a great day and that you enjoy this uh, sojourn of uh, Mars in the sign of Pisces. All right. Take care. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for sticking around. I'm really happy to be joined by my wife, Ashley, who is an herbalist. Hi, Ashley. Hey. And yeah, I'm really excited to be helping Ashley promote her upcoming program, which is something that you actually began teaching many years ago, this herbal apprenticeship program. Um, I think it was what, 2011 or 12 that it got started, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been over 10 years I've been offering this course and yeah, it's been, it's my favorite thing to teach. Yeah. And just to be clear, because some people on my channel, most people know you because you pop on here or there. We talk about herbs and astrology. There's uh, an attraction in our marriage and an attraction in the subject matter that is um, old. Like we've been together for, you know, 14 years in our relationship going on. Uh, and we've always had a fascination with each other's um, areas of expertise. And we've done lots of things to marry them together over the years, in addition to literally getting married. And, uh, <laughs> and actually, herbalists and astrologers have married the subjects of herbs and planets together for thousands of years as well. Now, your program is focused on, you know, uh, herbalism, it's not a, an astrology course, but there is certainly a lot of overlap in terms of the energetics and the spiritual approach to herbalism that you take. And so I was hoping that we could start off just by telling people a little bit about the program. You're coming to this after taking a little bit of time on maternity leave. Uh, our kids were not yet in school. Now they are. You're coming back to work. This is really exciting. Uh, the new program launches at the end of April. I'm going to put it up on the screen so people can see it. You can find it at Skyhouse Herbs dot com. Uh, enrollment is open now. The course begins. You go under courses, Herbal Foundations Apprenticeship at the end of April. Tell us about it. Well, this course, I guess my, my goal in redesigning the apprenticeship course that I've been teaching for 10 years is to make it even more personal and to allow people to study the material, digest it at their own pace. Um, so what it's going to be is a combination of kind of three main parts. Uh, the first one is the recorded material. So there's going to be modules that will be released and people can listen to them as they, you know, as they have time. Uh, the second part are live classes where we will meet live on Zoom and talk about the module, answer, I'll answer questions, I'll give even more information about it. And then the third part is the sacred plant pairings. And so I've always taught the, the herbal portion, like the plant diets one at a time, but this year I'm gonna do it in pairs because I think you can learn a lot by comparing and contrasting herbs. So for every module, you'll have two herbs to study and you'll get a little cheat sheet about them um, before you start the module. And then you'll have an opportunity to work with those two plants and blend them and keep them separate and just really work with them closely. Um, because my goal is that I want people to be able to find information that they can really use um, in their own lives, maybe with clients, um, if they whether they have a professional herbal practice or maybe they're a therapist in a different field, that they'll know these plants so that they can work with them um, really comfortably. I love the different modules that you have just so we can preview them for people. Module one is vitalism and the heart of herbalism. Module two, building your home apothecary. They're so diverse. I love module three is my favorite plant spirit medicine, uh, energetics and chemistry. You're having, you have such a holistic approach. It's what I've always loved about your teaching. You'll teach about the doctrine of signatures. You'll talk to people about how to communicate with plants, how to think of them as teachers that have, that are living beings that have personalities that aren't just you know, phytochemistry or whatever, but you will also teach phytochemistry. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that you have this really well-rounded way of helping people be intelligent about the plants, about the body, about the systems of the body, but also not afraid to use energetic systems, um, not afraid to take something from the kinds of energetics that ancient mystics were working with, whether that's the elements or whether that's, you know, some of the overlay with things like Ayurveda, Chinese yeah. medicine, you just... You take what's useful on a symbolic and energetic plane and on a personal connection level with the plants and you marry it to really smart scientific research. I think that that's rare. I do, you don't see that a lot. Mm, well, thank you for saying that. Yeah. I, to me, it's all language. They're just different languages that we talk about the same thing. And I think the more diverse our language is as herbalists, the more we can reach more people. And that's kind of my goal. Like I want everyone to like 
be able to identify plants, use plants. <laughs> so we need to diversify the languages we speak so we can talk with our physicians, so we can talk with a therapist, we can talk with a mystic, right? We can talk with children and we have a language that everyone can use. You you talk in the program, in your modules, you have stuff on digestive and gut health, you have stuff on detoxification, colds and flus, and you know dealing with virus seasons. You have You talk about tissue states and you're talking about how to give things to your kids for, you know, helping them maybe at times uh, even relax before bed at night. We use a lot of different things with our kids. I love this, that you have called this a, um, I want to, I'm going to find the phrase where you use, that you use, and I'm going to mess it up. A community (laughs) herbalist. What is a community herbalist so that people can understand that definition? Because sometimes people might look at a course like this and think, gosh, unless I go to uh, um, you know, an accredited university for, you know, eight years and learn all about chemistry. I have no right or business suggesting herbs to people or using herbs. That's just not true. And that's not the history of how folk herbal medicine has been used or taught. So what do you mean when you say community herbalist? I think you said it perfectly. It that This is the people's medicine and our grandmothers and great grandparents used plants as medicine. It's, there's nothing actually that <laughs> like hard ab- about the practice of herbal medicine. It's just getting to know the plants and getting to know the times when they're most useful. Uh, my, I really envision that this course, people can take it and yes, use it for themselves, number one, because I think a lot changes when we have the personal experience and then using it in your family, whether that's just, you know, maybe making a tea for your dog or, you know, if you have kids or maybe, maybe you just have a partner, maybe you have plants you can use and we'll talk about taking care of a garden, but using it for yourself, for whoever's immediately around you, and then taking it beyond that, because it's likely that at some point, you're going to be talking with someone. They're going to say, oh, you know, I've got this digestion thing and I've tried this and this. And they might say, hey, you're taking, you're studying herbs. Is there anything that you would recommend? And you know what? You'll probably have a few ideas. And that, you know, you never know how one way that you help someone out there in the world might trickle and then help others and more people. So I think through the self-knowledge and studying this, this knowledge in your own body, it'll naturally, it's like, you know, impossible for it not to spread out and start to affect the broader community. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, This is also for that reason, because we have a vision. I mean, you guys know through my Kickstarter, you guys helped us build the community herbal medicine garden that Ashley's been hosting free and donation based events out of that. The donations go back to right back into the garden and just growing the medicine that we then find ways of harvesting and giving to other people or letting other people come and harvest. We have a vision, we always have, back to the days when we had our yoga studio in Maryland, we have always had a vision of making this sacred knowledge accessible to people. Um, And that is both there in this program in terms of the way you're framing, framing what it means to be an herbalist. It might mean that you're a professional and you see clients, and you could continue beyond this program developing the skills to do that. This would certainly set you up for success. You could also go forward and be someone who uses what you know with um, friends and family and yourself. And that's an incredible set of tools to have. Um, The program's also very accessible from both a programming standpoint and a price standpoint. I'm going to take you back over and show everybody um, the programs, the modules are pre-recorded, but then you meet outside of the modules for discussion, community, Q&A, and sort of development and integration. So people can attend those live. If they miss those integration sessions, they can also watch the replays of those. So absolutely, yeah. anyone could take this at their own rate, you know, as slowly or as quickly as you wanted to really soak it in um, or, or blaze through it. And, you know, and then we can certainly be on this program as Ashley perhaps makes more advanced programs available as she's easing back in out of maternity leave can help you with further development or recommend you to many other wonderful programs where you could continue your studies. Um, we want this to be accessible. We want community herbalism to be, you know, as simple as, as being able to show a friend a couple of yoga stretches, we should be able to show each other herbs, you know, and just, Hey, this is a helpful herb to use. Also accessibility price-wise, we have an early bird enrollment uh, and we have a standard enrollment. And then we have tuition level 
one assistance and tuition assistance level two, which break out the affordable tuition into different levels of affordability. And you can kind of identify where you're at if you're someone who wants to take this program, but needs to work within your means and not hurt yourself doing it. And then for those who can pay, we ask that you use standard or early bird enrollment. And we've that's the same thing I do for all my astrology programs. So we try to keep it super, super accessible. The herbal apprenticeship program starts April 24th. Um, I know Ashley's super excited to be getting back into teaching too. Um, I also would like to offer Ashley just a chance to tell everyone a little bit about, before we end here, this interview, tell everyone maybe a little bit about your own background, who you studied with, what your uh, influences are, and just anything else you want to say before we, um, before we cap it off. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, my, my, I started off as a kid playing in the woods, I, you know, mixing perfumes and potions. Um, and then I went on to study environmental science where I studied organic chemistry and uh, restoring native wetlands. And really from an environmental perspective, that's how I got into uh, into herbalism. Um, and then after, you know, I, I realized after working on the restoration piece and joining a lot of um, earth advocacy groups that the problem's not with the earth, but with the people <laughs> not mm -hmm. understanding the value of the earth. So then I started going into holistic medicine. Um, I graduated from the university of North Carolina, Asheville with um, a degree in interdisciplinary studies. Um, and I went on to get my, um, Oh, that was my, that was my undergrad. And then I went, I got my master's from the um, Maryland University of Integrative Health. It was then called Thai Sophia. But my teachers there, you know, I had such a great blend of teachers, really scientific minds, like um, Simon Mills from the UK and Kevin Spellman, who is like a chemistry genius. He's also an Ayurvedic practitioner who studied with uh, Dr. Vasant Lad. Um, uh, Matthew Prisco, medicine maker from Galen's Way out in California. Uh, so I had a really wonderful, diverse uh, variety of teachers in that three-year full-time master's level program. And then after that, I went on to study with Matthew Wood pretty intensively because I liked his energetics. I liked the way he... Um, the way he spoke about the plants and his personal experience working with low-dose, uh, drop-dose medicine. And he has had amazing... Um, you know, uh, pro, you know, he's, he's done such amazing work herbally with just using that method. And, um, gosh, I, I could, there's, there's a, I've got a lot of herbalists in my David basket. Duke comes to mind. And, oh, Jim uh, Duke or Jim Duke. Sorry. Jim Duke, bad. Uh, Margie Flint, Rosemary Gladstar is like, I I've only done one herb walk with her, but it was amazing. So, you know, I have, I have shelves of, of herbal books and people who I just adore yeah. and, yeah, I just feel really grateful that I've had that blend of the science and the energetic herbalism and the traditional herbalist perspective as well. And um, and I try my best to blend them together and to give everyone um, a really diverse yet integrated herbal studying experience. Yeah, absolutely. You get that. That is exactly what you'll get if you um, sign up for Ashley's program, which I encourage you to do. If this is the kind of thing that interests you, um, you won't regret it. It's a fantastic course with someone I absolutely love, obviously, <laughs> but also like a really, truly fantastic human being and teacher of Aww. plant medicine. And um, if you want to learn more about her, see her work, get to know her a little bit, check out her YouTube channel, Skyhouse Herbs, where she publishes weekly on plant medicine, uh, plant energetics, and also on Instagram, which is Skyhouse Herbs. So the apprenticeship program starts April 24th. I wanted to get Ashley on, brag about her program, uh, turn you guys on to it. Thank you so much for being here. And um, yeah, we I'm, I'm sure that we were, go we're going to see some people from the nightlight astrology world uh, getting introduced to you and all of your magic. I would love that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Take it easy, everyone. Bye.